All right, good evening, everyone. As we're waiting for people to roll in, I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce myself and talk a little bit about this workshop that we put together. Um, so first, my name is Drew Lawrence. I'm the operations manager here at Military Veterans and Journalism. And um, we wanted to give you something a little bit different. Uh, a lot of times when we, we put these workshops on, we talk about the forward facing elements of journalism, in-depth reporting, investigative reporting, open source reporting, and, Obviously, as many of you know, there's there's a lot that goes on to it. There are people that build these platforms for, for reporters to, to show their work and, and build communities on. And today we're fortunate enough to uh, have one of the best in the military community, Paul Zoldra. Uh, many of you know him as the editor-in-chief of Task and Purpose, um, where in 2018 he, he took the reins and started building um, really what I would hazard to say is a uh, incredible pillar within the military reporting community um, and really giving a voice to, to those who haven't had a voice before that were in the military. Um, many of you may know him for, for founding the Duffel blog, um, but if you don't know, he is also a former Marine infantryman. He was in for eight years and he's been published in everything from We Are the Mighty to household names like Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. Um, and through all that writing, he was um, crazy enough to, to start uh, some of these platforms, which I know many of us have benefited from, um, whether it be reading it, um, reporting on it, um, or, or simply just uh, enjoying it as a platform. So uh, enough from me, Paul, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you just wanna give a quick introduction if I didn't cover anything, but it's, it's so great to, to have you tonight. Yeah, thanks, Drew. That was very nice of you to say, uh, <laughs> especially the part about being being the best. I don't know about that, but uh, I appreciate it. I'll take it. Um, yeah, I'll I'll say you know I, it's just really great uh, great to be here, and and for anybody on this this call, it's it's really uh, thank you for for joining us. Um, the one thing I'll just I guess I'll clarify is is. Um, you know, I've, I founded Duffel Blanc. Um, I, uh, I didn't start Task and Purpose, but I've uh, been there for three years and, and, you know, had a, had a hand in, in building it up to, to where it is. And, and I'll just, uh, I do want to give credit to where it's due, which is, you know, at Duffel Blanc, uh, you know, most of that, most of the writing is, it comes from uh, a, a really great uh, team of contributors. Uh, writers of all stripes from from different branches uh, of the military, um, and the same goes for Task and Purpose. I have a great editorial team that uh, that really like makes me look good. Uh, they do a whole lot of the work, um, and uh, and the and, and a lot of contributors too, of, of which Drew is one. And uh, I'm I was really happy about that. So um, just wanted to to mention that and and you know, shout out the, the real folks who are doing the hard work. <laughs> yeah, well, I no, I appreciate you uh, mentioning that. And I would love to, we'll, we'll get to, to task and purpose because I would love to talk about um, your amazing freelance program. But I, I wanted to start with um, Duffel Blanc and kind of where that idea started from um, and, and really how you put that into action. Because you know, we, we all have great ideas, but then when it comes to, to putting the uh, rubber to the road, it's, um, it takes a lot, and, and you know that firsthand. So can you tell us where you, where you got the idea and, and when it came into fruition? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the sort of the start of Duffel Blog, uh, it really begins uh, when I was in college. I was on the GI Bill. So I got out of the Marine Corps in 2010. And, um, you know, after eight years and, you know, like so many inside, used the, the post 9-11 GI Bill, went to the, the University of Tampa right down the road from CENTCOM and, um, and uh, went for, for business for an entrepreneurship degree. And uh, part of the process in an entrepreneurship program, uh, like the capstone really is to have a business plan to come up with a new concept for a business and they want to the the goal is to really like set you up for getting out the door you could graduate college and boom i'm in a startup um that that sounds easier than it really is uh but um it was uh it was in that process that you know i'm thinking up ideas for what kind of business I could start and 
my initial idea started with a as a website uh, called collegeveteran.com. Um, I was thinking that when I got out of the, the Marine Corps, it was really hard to understand all the ins and outs of the GI Bill. I think nowadays there's a lot more resources. You can Google around. The VA has a lot of information and it's, it's a lot better now uh, as far as, you know, the transition from, from the, the Marine Corps or the military in general to, to college. Um, but back then when I, uh, back then when I applied to University of Tampa, the reason I did was I just saw, uh, that it was a private school. It had like 6,000 attendees and I was like, oh, it must be good. And it costs a lot. <laughs> and so I applied not really knowing it was a good school. It really was, but, um, I didn't really have the information there. And so I thought, um, what if I start a website that, you know, kind of helps vets with, picking the right school, giving them the information they need before they go and that kind of thing. Um, and that was the basis of my idea and, you know, fleshing out that business idea. And in the process, I, I got into content marketing, um, you know, kind of trying to get traffic to a website and all these kind of different methods. And one of the big, biggest methods for that is blogging. And, uh, you know, every company around the world, they have blogs on their website, uh, sharing their latest information, you know, and, um, and I thought, um, it was sort of a flippant idea. I thought that the onion was, uh, I've always been a fan of the onion, uh, love them, but sometimes they, when they cover the military, in fact, just this week, they did a story on, uh, that was a military related. And it was like, it was recruiting. Yeah, it was absolutely like crap. Uh, it was, it was, it, so they, they do, if they, if they cover the military, it's pretty obvious. You can tell for the most part, they probably don't have anyone, uh, a military service member on staff or even knowledge of the military. Uh, they might, you know, mess up a rank, they might mess up a uniform or name tape or something. And, um, you know, as, most military veterans are aware uh, or are familiar with you watch a movie uh, and they get something wrong and it's just it's like aggravating it's very it just hurts you down to your bones to like ah, it's not a specialist that's a sergeant <laughs> so um, I I uh, I thought uh, I thought, ah, that was easy. I, that's pretty easy. I could do that. I could, I could do something similar. And, and I started Buffalo blog. Um, and it was a, uh, blog on that website. Um, first post I ever did was March 4th, 2012. So we're coming up on 10 years, uh, here next week. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty wild to, to think of that. Um, and, um, and then, you know, kind of launched it and, uh, within, um, within like a few, a couple months, um, I kind of, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to dig into this if you want me to, but within a couple months, uh, I sort of, I figured out that, okay, duffel blog is really the thing that people like, or they're really getting interested in here. And the college veteran thing, while, a good idea or a, a nice idea for veterans. It's just something that I can't, I'm not seeing take off and um, I got to focus on what's really working. And so um, I split them off, um, start, tried to work on both at the same time for a little bit. And then, then eventually uh, did Duffel Blog as its own website, uh, its own kind of, uh, own kind of thing and, and went from there. And so for Duffel Blog, um, you know, people are uh, most, mostly aware of what it is. But if you can give a, uh, a good example of something that the Duffel Blog has produced that kind of epitomizes what the Duffel Blog is, um, what would that be? What's a great example of, of some of the work that you've, you've done over the years for Duffel Blog? Uh, yeah, so I think, like, the best way to describe it is – you know, if you're familiar with The Onion, it's pretty easy. The Onion is a really well-known uh, satire publication. They've been around for 
20 some odd years and they're a parody of a newspaper. So they, they basically pretend to be this all knowing, all powerful newspaper that knows everything. And, and they put out really funny headlines, uh, really funny stories. Um, and they, they take a satirical bent. So what that means is they pick a target. They pick a target uh, that is deserving of ridicule. For example, the US government, the military, or whatever it is. Um, and then you know they they write uh, they write something usually funny cutting about it and we do we do basically that same thing for the military uh, and so some of some of those things could be like well for example the first story I ever published was uh, was Air Force Colonel uh, it, it, I'm I'm blowing the headline right now exactly but it's like Air Force Colonel is you know upset about Chair Force nickname and bans chairs. Uh, that was a 10 year old joke. It was, it was somewhat funny at the time. I think, <laughs> I think it's a little, it's, it rings true now. So it's, too, it's good. Yeah. But, um, you know, we do stuff like that. We will make fun of, uh, you know, crazy military cadences. Uh, we've had, we've had stories about, uh, general Mattis, uh, uh, when he was in the Marine Corps, uh, still in the Marine Corps, we had a story that, um was passed around a whole lot where we uh said that general mattis was being picked to be the commandant of the marine corps um which uh actually resulted in uh mattis getting a phone call from a air force actual air force general congratulating him <laughs> uh <laughs> um or I think that was his mother actually now that I remember it uh getting a congratulations your son got picked uh and um, another one that was really funny was uh, DOD uh, bans, uh, bans use of tap out gear uh, for OPSEC reasons uh, to, to make fun of soldiers who love wearing tap out and affliction shirts uh, everywhere. Right. Uh, that, one, that one ended up getting a public affairs uh, person in, at JBLM in Washington uh, a phone call or two, I heard. Uh, so. So uh, basically, basically what you're saying is, you know, these, um, while funny and, and they ring true, it's, um, you're seeing some impact here with uh, kind of like the comedy aspect of it. And you know, with that, I'm just wondering, because, you know, that's, that's really a, one of the measures of success when we, you know, have publications, right, is the, is the impact of what we're writing. Um, but, you know, can, what's, what it was some of the struggle in launching that, you know, before you got these, all of this impact, was there ever a moment where you kind of doubted anything about Duffel Blog or, um, you know, felt like, hey, you know, this might not work and, and how'd you overcome that and, and, you know, reach the success that Duffel Blog has today? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a moment I doubt, I doubt myself every day. Uh, <laughs> So I think, I think one thing, one thing that I've, I've learned is, uh, you know, we always look at, we always look at people that seem, you know, super successful and we're like, oh, they must have it all figured out, you know? And, um, I think, uh, I think everybody's dealing with whatever, there's all kinds of challenges that we usually don't know. Um, but, uh, and I really, the Delphi blog, the challenges were, were just um it, it's it was coming up with content um was a big one i when i first started it was it was uh once a week and then i moved to i started getting a little better and then i started doing twice a week and then i had writers reach out to me and say hey i like this thing you know do you ever bring on new people uh which i hadn't really thought about before um and and so that when that started happening, then it was like three times a week. And so it was like this constant stress of, do I have enough uh, to, to do a daily uh, duffel blog post? It was, we were working, um, we, we eventually got to the point of, of seven, seven days a week, we had a story every day. Um, and that's through the, you know, the, the network of contributors. But um, I mean, the struggles are, are a whole lot website problems, WordPress, tech, uh, all that stuff. Facebook, uh, 
is was was wonderful when it was wonderful and then it was horrible when it was horrible um and that's just the algorithm and the the news feed and all these changes um so you know every time i think i have duffel blog sort of figured out and it's you know i'm like all right i think we're doing okay uh then something changes um and so most recently in uh november uh um, last November, I think it was, um, I, I moved off a blog from a website, uh, off a website, moved it to the Substack platform. And, um, that was basically, that was really in response to these challenges. It was, it was a, um, it's really, really difficult for one, uh, like, you know, a single creator to, to start their own website and, and, you know, throw Google AdSense on there and think it's going to make a whole lot of money for you. Um, it's, I did that over the years at Duffelblog and, and, you know, I've, I've worked a full-time job that the whole time. Uh, and so like, it's it, that, like, it, it's just trying to make money on the internet. If you're just one person is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and so Substack came along and I was like, ooh, this, make, this makes sense. This is interesting. It's a newsletter. It's a little bit different of an experience uh, for readers. And also I uh, was really excited about memberships and thinking that that's the, the future of journalism and, and you know, just publications generally. And the, the experience of reading it is, is, you know, above and beyond what it was with like no ads, no nothing, just bothering you all day. Um, so it was a good move. Um, yeah. People like it, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's been, it's been really tough. I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, if you want to start your own thing, it's definitely, it's a lot of hustle. Um, so that's, that's like the, the main thing that, you know, to keep in mind, like it's, it's a lot of hustle. It's a lot of like, uh, working late nights and weekends and stuff like that to really get it moving. And, and I appreciate you mentioning that because, you know, that's a, that's a very good view of the macro holistic, um, view of, of duffel blog and, and kind of how to be successful on, on different platforms. But, you know, with that hustle, what's the, what's the day-to-day -day for duffel blog look like? Is it, you know, what, it, what do you do every day to make sure that those, um, you know, long-term goals are still being met? Uh, does it look the same every day? Is it different? And how much, um, you know, feedback are you consuming from, you know, the Duffel blog community or readership? Is that something that you listen to? Yeah, I'll take the last part. I mean, that's, a, I do a lot. Um, so, you know, it, when I started Duffel blog and then I, I, I started Duffel blog, I also got into journalism at the same time, right around the same time. Um, you know, I started an internship with, with Business Insider and um, the, uh, for a while I was really kind of worried, you know, like does Duffel blog, does this satire thing, is this going to affect my credibility as a journalist that I'm, you know, basically putting out this thing that's, you know, made up. Um, and so I wrote under a pseudonym and kind of, I sort of like kept some distance from it and um you know, eventually I, I, I came to realize that, uh, it helps, it helps a lot. It's actually more of a, a help than a hindrance. Um, and a lot of people talk, you know, in my journalism career, a lot of people talk to me and they're like, Oh, you're the duffel blog guy. I know duffel blog. And then it's like, you have that immediate rapport. Um, but, um, but yeah, day to day is, is, um, it's, it's usually different, um, but Duffel Blog now it's it's a it's kind of like a do uh, I still do it on on at nights weekends or whatever. My wife helps me a whole lot now. Uh, she is a she is a wonderful and great editor. Um, and she's behind the camera, isn't she? Yeah, she's like she's right <laughs> she's right here, uh, but uh, she's she's holding a gun to my head, but. Um, um, she helps me a lot on it, but right now, now it's, it's just a lot of monitoring, um, fielding, fielding pitches. We have like a writer's room virtually on Facebook where people pitch ideas and we talk about, you know, articles and what we can work on next. 
and um, and you know usually it kind of it, right now we put out about four stories a week mm -hmm. uh, so so usually it boils down to like on Saturday or Sunday uh, I'm I'm looking at what we got kind of scheduling out the week getting that all set and that way I can focus on my day job um, and then if events happen, which they're happening right now with with Ukraine, uh, like yesterday, like last night, uh, we got we got a new story and uh, it's actually pretty funny. It's about like Toby Keithovich, uh, the Russian country star, uh, putting out uh, putting out a new single called Courtesy of the Blue, White and Red. Um, it's very funny uh, and makes fun of Vladimir Putin a whole lot, which he totally deserves. And um, and uh, that one, you know, that one just came in. And so I was like swapping that out real quick and moving, moving something else that's not more timely. Um, and so, you know, with those that contribute your network, um, for those in the audience who are, who are interested in con contributing to the Duffel Blog, what's the, you know, what are the steps for that? How, how would they, you know, a Duffel Blog saying, hey, I have this great idea and I'd love to, I'd love to pitch it and write something for you. Oh, that's a good question. And actually, it reminds me that I need to make a part of the site that has this on it. Uh, we used to have that on the on the site. Uh, now, it's Substack, it's a little bit different. But um, but the process uh, for being a contributor uh, over the years, it's it's evolved. But it, it's it's right now. It's um, um, we. Uh, first off it's it's all military veteran writers um so everybody's an active duty or veteran um of the service we we've had civilians um um we actually had a, a civilian editor for for a while and he was really good so it's not it's not a total disqualification but uh most of, most of the time you know the, the the ideas come from within the ranks and so it just makes sense um so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's basically coming up with the, the application is 15 headlines um, and, uh, you know, it's some information about yourself and then a writing sample. And the writing sample is really the, 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 the most important part of it, uh, you know, it needs to catch my attention, needs to be, needs to be funny, uh, well-written and sort of conforming to that new style of writing. And, um, and then, you know, and then I get, I get those applications and kind of like every once in a while, um, uh, when we start, we, we open the gates and add some more people, um, you know, it's, it's usually every, every few months or so, um, if not a little more, um, you know, I'll, I'll go into my applications and then start picking people who wants to join, um, and we add them on and they, they, we have a we have a style guide and 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 the group is really good uh the group of writers that are uh with me now they're really good with uh kind of taking new folks and and helping orient them and and um give them really good feedback you know because they've been around for a while so it's it's um so anyway the application to get on duffel blog is right now um not open, but um, if you are a subscriber, <laughs> uh, free subscriber, uh, so you don't have to pay, but uh, subscribe to the to the Duffel Blog list, and uh, when it does open up, I'll I, I will be putting like I'll make a public announcement um, and and open it up, and we've done that in the past. We've gotten uh, a couple of new writers uh, through the newsletter uh, since we started, and. I want to transition to uh, task and purpose. Before we do, I, I got a question about about Duffel Blog. Um, how did you, you know, develop the business model for Duffel Blog, and how has that worked out economically over the years? Yeah, I got to be really honest. I am, I, despite going to business school, I'm not the best businessman. Uh, I am really my expertise and my passion is is really on the creative side and just you know creating really good content thinking about the audience what they're going to respond to what they really love not doing stuff they don't like uh you know challenging them a little bit but just coming up with 
I'm, I'm really like an ideas person. Um, and, you know, trying to make that into a business, I've like failed repeatedly throughout the years uh, until basically getting to Substack. I think for, for most of the time, um, you know, Duffel Blog has basically been, it's a website. The business model is pretty simple. It's a website, get as many page views as possible. So that way people see the ads and they click them and you get money. Uh, that was a pretty decent model when I started in uh, 2012 when Google AdSense and other advertisers were, were paying out pretty well. And that sort of went downward um, as the years have gone by. And, and at the same time, Facebook's algorithm has also gone downward uh, in terms of distributing the content and getting people to see it. And so for, for a while, um, uh, before the Substack move, it was uh, really just uh, like banging my head against a wall trying to figure out what to do. I, I had, you know, we've had various kind of things about like, oh, we could start a t-shirt store like every other military company. We're, you know, throwing some t-shirts out there, like all these kind of ideas to, to make money. But um, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the best way to do it uh, that, that I've found is, is really uh, going to the audience, uh, presenting them with our value proposition, which is we are the first and only parody uh, military newsletter in the world. Uh, we've been around for 10 years. We are you know, a reliable friend in your inbox now will will bring you, you know, a laugh at, you know, zero five in the morning and before you got to go into the Pentagon. And, um, and in, in exchange for that, uh, in exchange for your, like, that's in, it's in exchange for your support, you know, that's, that's been the message on Substack. It's, it's not like a, it's not a, uh, like, you know, give us five bucks and we'll give you, you know, more content. The paid subscribers do get that, but, uh, you know, they get two more articles, uh, that the, there's two free articles, but really the, the, the hook that most people are in it for, um, and, and, and really for the writers too, is they love it. You know, they want to support it. They want to keep it going. And, and I'm incredibly thankful for that. Um, it's, it's really, uh, it's really amazing, um, you know, and I, I, I just can't thank people enough for, for, you know, keeping Duffelblog afloat, because uh, it, it, it's, you know, relying on ads, uh, it's, it basically makes you, um, you have to sell your audience, you know, like, your, your business is not, um, your business is separate from your readership. You're trying to get readership and then you're also trying to extract money from them in some other way. Um, the, the membership approach is, is a very symbiotic shared relationship where uh, I am guaranteeing you I'm going to give you something that you value um, and, and you're willing to pay for that. And um, and I, I, I really believe in that really strongly. And I, I, I support uh, publications like that myself. You know, I subscribe to the New York Times. I don't read the New York Times every single day, but I think it's important. They do really, really good journalism and it's, it's worth five bucks uh, a month or whatever it is uh, for me to pay. Same thing for Washington Post. And same thing for for a few sub stacks uh, that I subscribe to. You know, there's uh, there's a couple out there that that I find a lot of value in, um, and you know, I'm willing to open up my wallet and and throw them throw them you know five bucks a month because I get a lot of value out of that coming in my inbox every day, and that's really what I'm hoping for with with Duffel Blog is is you know, hopefully I'm providing some level of value for the readers. And, and if not, they can, they'll cancel, they'll go somewhere else. And that's, that's their right. And that's how they signal to me that I'm screwing up, <laughs> that I'm not doing yeah. the right thing. 
Yeah. So shifting from you know uh, satire to, to something more serious um, is is task and purpose. And I just want to start in in saying that one of the things that I appreciate about you know that publication is you can kind of have you've done a good job of making uh, both available to your audience, where you can have um, really you know humorous and um, important stories like. Um, you know, the soldiers at Abbey Gate or, uh, you know, during the, the, um, the uh, withdrawal of Afghanistan trading, you know, cans of dip for, for a technical truck or something like that to, um, you know, Haley Britsky had a great story about um, the Red Hill water contamination that got um, quite a lot of attention and, um, and, and impact. Um, and so, so with that, I, you know, how did you kind of develop that, that balance where you can, you can do both and you can do both well. Huh. Yeah, it's, um, I think it all comes down to audience focus. So, uh, you know, we've made a deliberate effort uh, at task and purpose to really hone in on who our, who our core reader is. Um, that's not to say that not everybody's welcome because they are, um, but our core reader, the person that we speak to is the, the junior military officer and the junior enlisted service member. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because most, most, uh, most military news organizations don't do that. They focus on the principles at the top, they like to talk to talk to or about a whole lot of generals. They like to talk about defense contracts or you know weapon systems or thing you know something that you know Raytheon would be would love to sponsor and have banner ads next to it. Um, I don't think uh, my audience cares about that all that much, and and the reason I think that is because I was a Marine and I I uh, I you know was in for eight years. I was a sergeant. So I was the audience that I'm trying to get now. And, um, you know, I have an understanding of that in addition to, you know, reporting over the years. And of course, my staff is really, really helpful in, 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 in sort of, you know, understanding who, who we're trying to reach. But um, we're always thinking about the why. Like, why does this matter to Specialist Smith? that's out in Hawaii, you know, or why does this, why does, you know, Sergeant so-and-so in at Fort Bragg, why are they going to click on this article that we're working on right now? We do, uh, we, we take our time in really um, trying to understand the one is the story that we're working on. Is it actually important? Um, is it, does it rise to the level of, Hey, we need to, we need to lend our platform to, to covering this. And then how do we do that in a way that shows our core reader why they actually have, they, they should care. So it's not enough to say like, you know, uh, you know, this thing happened in Afghanistan, you know, Afghanistan news uh, and task and purposes, I, I know firsthand, like it's hard and I'm sure it's across the board, you know, uh, prior to our pullout, Afghanistan news was really difficult to break through. You know, the American people don't really care about Afghanistan. They just don't. Um, and the polls reflect it. And so do the, so do the page views on, on stories about Afghanistan. Um, so, that, you know, understanding that, that you know that you're, you're in an uphill battle of trying to break through, that's, that's one story, that's Afghanistan, but we take that, that, we take that tack on every story, you know, like, why the hell is a soldier going to read this story today, and if we can't answer that question, we, we just don't do it, we skip it, you know, and so we don't, we don't, we don't, we try not to do uh, we don't do, you know, breaking news, you know, like everything in the military news, uh, in the news cycle. We don't cover every single little development. 
um, we we take uh, we take uh, the time to to really um, find the stories that you know actually are matter and are going to resonate, and those are those things like you know per, uh, the Pearl Harbor water. Um, you know your story, uh, and I'll call you out, Drew. But your your freelance piece on on uh, you know Afghan uh, civ civ uh, or visa applicants, you know, being screwed over, um, that was really important. That was really important to me that that was that would be on our site. Um, and you know, it's um, I think just a lot of a lot of the time, I guess I I'll. I'll look at some stories out there and I'm like, we will cut, co we're covering stuff that most people won't. Um, and you know, that, that's fine. I, I, but I do wish more people did, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, that's, and I, I appreciate you mentioning that. And, um, you know, gl I'm glad you called me out because there, I, I didn't, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the freelance network and how that contributes to, you know, the entrepreneurial and, and business side of, of task and purpose. Um, we, we had a good question from uh, Travis that is that, that could lead into this, but, um, you know, how should a freelance writer approach sharing story ideas with organizations? Meaning, I have an idea, however, I'm still researching it fully to get it going. Can I, you know, be protected from scoop stealing or should I just write a draft and be protected by copyright when it's ready? W what are your thoughts on that, Paul? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think I've heard of this before. I've never been a freelancer myself, mm -hmm. um, but I've been on the other side of that getting lots of pitches. So um, I think the, the, the worry about getting your, your story stolen, I've heard of this before. I don't think it's really a thing to, to worry so much about. Uh, and this is just me speculating here. So I, I, you know, maybe it has happened, but in my mind, if you pitch an outlet and then, if, you know, eventually it gets stolen and you see it on the outlet, uh, you know, one, like, I mean, I would straight up call them out publicly about that or like email the editor because that's really screwed up and totally wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, usually, usually pitches go, uh, the best pitches I see and, and we have, uh, we have our pitch guidelines. Uh, if you want to send those out later, um, it has, it has all this, all this kind of stuff in it, but the best pitches I see have a, you know, the subject line is, is really like a, like a headline. Um, it, you know, remember you're, 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 you're reaching out to usually to an editor with an inbox that is an absolute disaster zone uh, of emails, like, all over the place. I get messages on every platform imaginable uh, to the point where I get to the end of the day that I, I don't even remember all the people I talked to, but I can tell you it's a lot. <laughs> and uh, so breaking through my inbox starts with the subject line um, and framing the story, like framing a strong story with like your headline or something close to it as possible is going to get me to open it up. And then the, you know, freelancers, I, uh, freelance pitches I get, uh, some people will have a full draft, like, hey, I wrote this whole thing, are you interested? And I'll look those over, those are, those are fine. I prefer people not do those because I would rather, as an editor, uh, not waste your time. Like, I want you to be working on something that's actually commissioned that's going to run versus you writing something. And then, you know, I kind of feel bad, like you wrote this thing, but I can't use it. Um, so it's always better to just pitch the idea. And, you know, it's like, hey, I'm so and so I'm a freelancer. And here's, you know, here's a few things I've done in the past, especially the ones in like mainstream publications, if you have those. Um, I've got a, I've got an idea for you and just kind of basically get me excited, you know, like, Ooh, you know, like this is a, you know, some understanding of what the story is going to be, who you might be talking to, what kind of research is going to go, go into it. And, uh, most of the time at the end of the day, when you're dealing with an editor, they're like always looking for new, new stuff, new content, wherever it's coming from. So, um, 
it's uh, you know, if you if you if you wow me in the inbox, you're going to get a response. Um, if you don't, um, that's not a reason to give up. Just keep trying. Um, I, I tell my reporters, uh, no response does not mean no. So, you know, that's, that's like freelance, that's call-in sources, that's everything. If you don't hear no, then keep going. <laughs> and, well, and, I, and before I move on to the, to the next question, that's more, um, you know, business related, having been on the, the other side as a freelancer, specifically one for, you know, task and purpose, you know, to, to answer that question, like I, I know that if I did have a scoop, Paul, and he doesn't want it, Paul's not going to steal it. Task and purpose is going to steal it. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of like the, the trust that I, I would hang my hat on with, with freelancing for you. Um, but also, you know, to the pitch thing, like the, um, you know, having it be a page, it's like a resume. Um, you know, yeah, I'm sure you've received pitches that have been uh, maybe fully written pieces or ones that are just really, really long, but um, you know, the ones I've sent to you and other organizations have been a page, sometimes less with a, you know, a, a catchy headline that, that kind of grabs your attention. And there have been some times where I've reached out again and it turned out to be, you know, a piece that they weren't interest, interested in and just, you know, sat in the inbox. So, uh, yeah. but, that, but that is good advice. And I, I kind of want to bring it to kind of like the, the bigger scope here with, with task and purpose, because you, know, you have this, this freelancer network, you have a really great core of, of staff reporters. Um, but one in, in, you know, that's kind of like the outward facing thing, but you know, how does that translate to, um, clicks, views, how long someone stays on a, on a piece? Um, and then how, how does that translate into profit for, for task and purpose? Um, you know, just to, for, for other organizations like New York times, like there's like, they've, you know, have subscriptions, but they also have, um, you know, a wine club that you can, you can, you know, uh, join and for, for a certain fee that contributes to their, their new, their news gathering. Um, so, so given that, you know, what, what is, what is the business side of task and purpose look like and where is it, where is it going? Do you, do you see yourself implementing some of those, um, things to help task and purpose get money or are you happy where you are right now? Yeah. Um, you know, on the business side of things, I think it's a little bit different for, for me, I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm editor in chief, but, and then, so I have some insight into the business, uh, business side of things, but we also take the, you know, take the, the, the wall, you know, uh, seriously between sales and, and, and journalism. So, um, you know, what I know of task and purpose is, is we're doing well, uh, what the specifics are, uh, don't really know that and, and honestly don't want to know. Um, I, I want to focus on, on, on the audience and serving them well. Um, and, and knowing that stuff, um, it's, uh, it clouds your judgment sometimes. Um, and so as much as you can try to keep that separation and, you know, different organizations have different policies and there's all kinds of controversy and all kinds of different media companies about this, but as much as you can, I, I'd say um, the, you know, you're, if you want a business strategy, a business model is serve your audience really well, and then you'll find a way to make money off of them, but not the other way around. Um, you know, a lot of people think of like the business side first, like how do we make money? And they're, they're forgetting that you need to serve the audience and build them up and make your audience really good and valuable and they'll stick with you. Um, it's not an exploitative exercise, nor it shouldn't be anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, but I think like the freelance network thing, um, we, uh, we've, we've got about 30, uh, plus something like that. Um, you know, new contributors that we've, we've published since, uh, kind of launching that, uh, late, late last year, uh, plans to, to keep going. I mean, it's, it's definitely ramping up and what that's, what that's translated to is, is it's, 
Um, it's let us do stuff that we really haven't been able to do before. I've, I've published a, uh, I published, you know, just an example, I published a, an investigation of the, uh, the, the deadliest bombing um, of the Iraq war. It was a, a defect that got bombed and I think it was 2004, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, uh, you know, launching the contributors network that allowed me to get, you know, I got this, got in contact with a reporter who was actually there. And this was a passion project, uh, really wanted to get this published. And, and um, that's, that's perfect. That's exactly what the, the kind of stories we're looking for. It's got, you know, it's historically important. Um, you know, people are, are affected by it and still affected by it by it to this very day. Um, and, and, you know, those stories get read. Um, and so the, it lets us do more, it lets us do, um, you know, less newsy stuff and more kind of featurey kind of items, uh, is what, what I use my use the contributor network for. So my staff, uh, you know, works on most of the, like the news, the, the stuff that's, you know, most important, what's going on right now um and and you know an occasional investigation things like that and then i i have uh I have opportunities abound for things outside that uh things in that are going to be investigative uh maybe funny or fun uh things like we have a section called mandatory fun which is uh sort of offbeat kind of things like one contributor wrote a uh, a story about why Squid Game is similar to the military, um, you know, just kind of like the 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 the, the, the things that you uh, you notice are kind of common there, uh, and um, we've had other ones where we had a sergeant major uh, analyze The Walking Dead and how uh, the the people the survivors are all idiots uh, tactically, um, so. You know, it just it just allows us to do a lot more, and and frankly, it it's uh, I really like it. It's it's sort of my it's like my secret plot to get more veteran writers published. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I I I tell my tell my higher ups, you know, we're doing this freelance network and it's all great, and that's all true. Don't get me wrong, but I also am thinking in my back of my mind, like, oh yeah, like I got I have more an opportunity to get more people like me, like I was in, you know, 2012, an intern uh, being published for the first time as a contributor at Business Insider. Um, I see, I see myself in, in people pitching me now, you know, and, and trying to open up those opportunities as much as my, uh, as much as I can within the, the, the allotted budget I have. Um, and, and, you know, because I'm really passionate about, you know, more military veterans being in journalism and that representation is, is really important to me. Um, and so it's, it's, it's going pretty well. And I think if anybody else is, if anybody is here on the call and has ideas, um, uh, you know, I like, I'll, I'll certainly talk to you as a, you know, a like, hey, if you have an assignment, um, I'm available. Uh, kind of person, um, but most of what I'm looking for is is your own ideas. Uh, the best ideas that we're going to get from a from our contributors network is going to come from the contributors themselves, not from my brain or any of our staff. Um, and I've been really, really impressed with the the kinds of uh, pieces that I've I've got so far. I mean. Uh, just one more I'll, I'll mention that's really like I'm incredibly proud of is, is we had a um, we had a uh, active duty uh, Marine officer, a female Marine officer uh, write an open letter to uh, the general who uh, basically let her sexual harasser, her assailant, get off with a slap on a wrist. Uh, it was one of the most the bravest pieces of writing I've ever seen. Uh, as a Marine, I know how, uh, you know, doing anything in the media as a Marine is like, nope, not good. You're, you're branded as bad, you know, and they're in the ranks. 
talking to reporters, not good, but uh, that's above and beyond. That's calling out a, a general uh, in public and, and um, you know, kudos to her. Her name is uh, Sybil Greenberg and, and she, um, she didn't deserve that treatment. And um, I, I, I couldn't be more proud of publishing that and um, getting her story out. And, you know, it's, it's not really about just about her story. I mean, I wish, I hope that that general takes that and, and reverses decision, but really it's also about shining a light on uh, these issues. So hopefully, you know, general down the road thinks twice about doing something like that. At least that's my hope. <laughs> yeah. No, I, no, and I appreciate you, you mentioning that. And I'm, I have two more questions before I open it up to the, uh, to the audience um, to, to ask you questions. But, um, you know, with, with that contributor network, it's obviously, you know, it's clear to me with what you're saying that it's made, you know, um, task and purpose like a much richer publication. There's a lot more depth in, in the pieces that you're talking about. Um, you know, how does, that, how does that translate to, I guess, task and purpose's future? Like, I, that's, to me, that seems like a great, um, you know, way to grow task and purpose into even more of a, of a pillar of the community. But, you know, what does that look like to you? What is that success based on, you know, contributor network and pieces like that? What does that look like to you in your mind? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it, it just, it makes, um, it's all part of, uh, everything works together now. Um, you know, our, you know, the contributors network on paper is separate. You know, it's, we have staff writers and then we have contributing writers or freelance writers or, or whatever you have there. Um, and they seem separate, but really the contributor network allows us, it helps us in reporting too. And we use the contributors network in our reporting. So, uh, you know, just another example, the AAV, uh, 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 what was it? The, the vehicle incident, I, I think it was eight Marines and sailors killed um, in, uh, off the coast of California last year. Um, horrible disaster, uh, absolutely horrendous and totally preventable. And we saw that in the investigation that came later. Uh, we saw uh, changes to training uh, and, and waterborne operations uh, for, for amphibious vehicles. Uh, before all of that, there was a, uh, a guy named Walt Yates who approached me um, about doing a piece uh, about this issue. And um, he was a retired Marine colonel uh, who was uh, deeply familiar with uh, all of the regulations, all the safety and training concerns and all of the things that go into an AAV deployment. And he realized that uh, the Marine Corps was uh, it basically swept this under the rug and just kind of kicked the ball down the road. And he wrote a piece for us showing that a previous investigation of, of a similar incident uh, and an investigation actually said, you should make these changes. And he showed that they didn't make any of these changes and it led to the deaths of these Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a uh, piece that had a lot of impact. Uh, it was read, read, read quite, quite a bit. Um, and then after we published that, for uh, I'd say at least two, maybe three additional stories because we were reporting on this issue throughout is we kept referencing back to Walt's expertise in the stories. And so he was, he was essentially a source for us. Yeah. Uh, he's an on record source uh, as a contributor. And then he helps really bolster our reporting with quoting from his piece and, and all that investigation, uh, all the revelations that he, that he put on our website. Now we can reference back to that and use it in follow on pieces. And we do that 
we do that uh, quite a bit now. Um, you know, if we have like first person perspectives, uh, you know, like, like I like to, to put the voices of the people on the ground or in the air, you know, into stories as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And, and so like, instead of just, you know, referencing some kind of historical thing, like, Hey, this thing happened and then you're moving on before you move on. I want to quote from somebody there. And I want, I want you to understand what it felt like uh, to be there, at least try to. And, uh, you know, firsthand perspectives on the war in Afghanistan or, you know, you know, being in combat or, you know, whatever it is, uh, those, are, those are really great for that kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it, makes, it makes our reporting a lot richer and, and readers get a lot more out of it. I want to, I'm going to open it up to, um, to the audience. If you're in the audience and you want to ask a question, you can uh, go ahead and use the, the raise your hand uh, feature and I'll um, click allow you to talk so you can talk to Paul directly. Um, here we have one coming in right now. Go ahead, Mateo. Yeah, good morning. I'm just wondering, um, what did you learn in school that you uh, didn't know before that allowed you to uh, apply what you learned in school to your project uh, duffel um wait could you can you say that one more time and say what, yeah, what, what, did, what did you learn what did you learn in college and you with your entrepreneurial degree that you took away that you used in your project duffel gotcha um so I guess the 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 biggest takeaway um, the the biggest takeaway I guess from college um, uh, my entrepreneurship program is like a lot of theory so it's a lot about like pitching uh, pitching your you know coming up with a business plan uh, pitching your idea to investors trying to you know raise money and things like that and didn't really focus really that much on like the business basics, like how to do accounting, you know, how to do like how to pay taxes, all these things, like all that stuff. They just, they just skip that part. You just have to learn that and screw it up on your own, which I totally did. Um, the, the biggest takeaway for me from, from the entrepreneurship program is coming up with, with an idea for like what to, what to work on. Um, that's how I came up with college veteran. It's really how I come up with duffel blog. I mean, it's like, it's every idea comes from a problem. So if there isn't really a problem that you're solving, um, then you know, like you should reconsider what you're what you're working on. Uh, for for college veteran, it was like, okay, like this problem is that I'm frustrated by the college, you know, picking a college. It's my own personal experience is frustrating. I I wanna I wanna solve that for other people. And so that is, that's the, the genesis of, 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 uh, of the college veteran idea. You know, the same thing goes for like the onion. Oh, the problem is that they really don't do the thing that I want them to do. Uh, and I think they can do it better. So, you know, here's my solution. It's really like, I think about things in, in, in those terms, like what's the problem? And what's the solution that I can I can I can uh, do for that? Um, and it, it, you know, and that's that's a business perspective. But it's like same thing goes for for you know picking stories and and on duffel blog or task and purpose. It's it's not necessarily the problem, but it's like why the hell is the the audience going to read this? Um, Mateo, I saw you uh, you raised your hand again. Do you have a, a follow up? Yeah. Um, so. Are you doing duffel and test and purpose? I am. I'm a I'm a glutton for punishment. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and then um, I'm just wondering, like, uh, what's your audience size and what's your revenue sources and what do you pay your contributors and your staff for duffel blog or for both? Well, for both, I think. Um. So duffel blog, duffel blog, we've got. Um, uh, 30,000, uh, readers on the free side. Um, 
and then we've got 1400 or so paid um, and uh, ba -ba -ba, task and purpose um, is significantly greater than that uh, but it's an advertising model so it's it's a, it's a little different ball game but uh, the the visitors there it's it's in the millions i can't really tell you exactly uh because yeah. probably probably somebody in my company will will get mad at me for it but um we're definitely reaching uh millions of of visitors uh visitors a month um and that's that's uh you know our, like i like i said before the the core is really those the junior the junior uh military service members that's the core but our uh the way we approach things and, and write, uh, I try to be inclusive. And so that means like spelling stuff out. Uh, if, if, uh, if, a, if a person who has no military experience whatsoever right. comes upon this article, they should be able to know what, what the heck I'm actually telling them. And, th and that goes duffel blog and, and task and purpose too. You know, I, I try to, um, I, I think both of those, both the publications uh, serve to help uh, bridge the civil military divide a little bit and, and yeah. educate people that are outside of the military about the military. Um, in fact, uh, Task and Purpose, we have this new video uh, series we're, we're doing called Task and Purpose Military Basics. And uh, one, one was about uh, what, what everybody's uniform is because they all got all different ones and nobody knows how to tell, tell, tell them apart. Um, and we got we got one coming up about uh, explaining why you're not supposed to uh, call Marine soldier uh, and, and yeah. all, all the nuance there. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. And since since nobody else is really I don't, I don't know if any, I can't see like if there's anybody else that wants to ask questions or talk to you. But you, you I'm really again. curious about like ahead, uh, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of started in journalism radio broadcast my mom was a broadcaster so i kind of was like you know early 80s i started to write learn about broadcasting and news and everything and i just have seen like the evolution of journalism and to where it is today it, to me it's very very weird it's like uh, you know either you're 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 labeled as kind of a, a liberal publication or you're labeled as a conservative publication so there's like, it seems like journalism has become divided on you know, like red journalism and blue journalism. Where do you, where do you, where do you, where do you stand on that as far as like when you're thinking as, you know, the leader of this publication, do you, do you feel that too? Do you see that too? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think the, the, it's no secret that uh, there's a lot of distrust in, in journalism just generally. Um, some of it is warranted. Uh, some of it is just, you know, politicians that are, that are attacking journalists uh, and people are, are choosing to, to go along with that line. And, and, and that's disappointing to me because I, uh, I and the rest of my staff and a whole lot of journalists I know work their butts off to, to work independent and and try to get it right every single day. You know, it's not from a partisan perspective, um, but uh, you know, outlets are are labeled partisan. I mean, Task and Purpose uh, had a it came on the scene in 2014, and it was this is before I I was with the with the organization. Um, they 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 were seen as like the more liberal uh, military news website. Um, and that was kind of the, that was kind of the take, that was kind of the, the way it was for, for quite a while. Uh, and, and some of that is because they covered stuff that other, you know, right <laughs> publications, uh, wouldn't even touch. Um, but, uh, um, that, that was the, that was a, the case for a while. When I came on board, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a political independent, uh, and so, um, and I'm, I try very hard not to get into the left, right kind of thing. Um, my, my stance on where our publication is, is not a really a left, right thing. Uh, it's more of a, uh, junior service member versus the top. 
So I am, I will own uh, our, I own our bias as far as we are in favor of the junior enlisted, the junior officer, we elevate their concerns, we take their, uh, their issues seriously. We, we take, you know, we get tips about mold in the barracks and we're going to take that up to generals and say, what the hell? Why is this happening? Uh, why aren't you fixing this problem? Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit of a, um, you know, it gets a little testy, you know, but it's like, it's really, um, I think, I, I just think like left, right doesn't matter. It's just serving your audience. So like, I, I, there's publications that have done that, you know, it, as much as like, I don't really like it all that much, you know, but it is what it is. And, and uh, most of the time they're, they're serving what their reader interests are and, you know, whether we like it or not, like, that's just, that's just the way it is. So I, I think for us and, you know, if we're starting publications or writing or, or whatever it is, uh, it's uh, do your part, you know, like do your, do the best you can. I, I, I don't, um, I don't take like the critique of like the, the whole, all the media is liberal or all that kind of stuff. Like people paint a broad brush over the media as if like, we're all, you know, meeting in a room every day and we're coming up with the agenda, like, hey guys, liberal agenda, here's what it is, like, here's how we're going to do it, as if we're like a big blob. And I just don't respond to those people. I think that's like, that's bizarre. It's like, it's like saying, you know, you know, all of your football team is like, you know, it's like, it's just, it's a painting with a broad brush and it's, it's really lazy thinking. Um, if a journalist screws up, if they get it wrong, then criticize that journalist. Uh, if, a, if an outlet and an outlet truly is an outlet at fault, then criticize that outlet. But um, the, the like, the, um, the like, just throwing labels on thing, I think, on things, we have a tendency to do that, especially these days. And um, it usually leads to like the end of the conversation, not the start of it, you know. Mateo, I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, I'm gonna give uh, Jeff a chance to, uh, to ask a question here. Hey, can everybody hear me? Not sure if my mic's yeah. on. Yeah, we got you. Awesome. Hey, awesome, Paul, first off, thank you for, uh, for coming and it's great to uh, chat with you again, uh, if only virtually. So uh, my question is regarding uh, freelancing. So. In, in my case, I, I want to continue my journey, you know, as a freelance photojournalist, and I kind of branched out into real estate investing as a way to supplement my income during the periods in which I'm not, I'm not writing. I've engaged with quite a few freelance writers, and a common theme is a lot of them who are, especially those who have been for less than, you know, five years or so, I found are there's the constant pressure to continuously publish, right? And so sort of my vision is, you know, just for me personally, and hopefully, you know, maybe this will bring perspective to others on the call as well. My vision is to kind of supplement my income through my other business endeavors while trying to find, you know, good stories to actually go and, and you know, do, do, do work on. And with that, you know, there are a lot of expenses that a freelancer can incur when you're trying to go out and find these stories. Uh, you know, if you're utilizing your network and kind of have your ear to the ground looking for something relevant. And my question is, is in your opinion, how do you keep freelancing, I guess, uh, as a viable, you know, you know, viable living when there are a lot of extraneous expenses that can get incurred by freelancers mm -hmm. like you know traveling and such and how much if at all should you know a, a prospective freelancer be like asking uh you know as a as far as like financially from a you know from a newspaper you know for their work um 
and specifically regarding like the reimbursement of expenses that were incurred during the, you know, the process of going out and finding a story. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I appreciate the question and, and it's good to, it's good to talk to you again. <laughs> Jeff is, uh, Jeff is actually a freelancer or did a freelance piece for us, uh, about, uh, EOD soldiers, uh, it's really good. So, um, I think, I think really, uh, the, the, the first thing is, is you got to know what your situation is and what your break even is, you know, like your personal break even, um, my, my wife and I, we kind of joke about this, but it's like, you know, we call it like team Zoldra, you know, like what's, what's the, what's the profit loss statement? Like that kind of, like we talk about like us, we're a team. What do we need to come bring in, you know, to, to sustain ourselves? And I have a full-time job, so it's a little bit different, but, um, as a freelancer, you got to know what your break even is, what you need to make in a month. Um, and, and I think it's good to do that um, and really do that for, for a lot of other things. Like think of what the goal is in mind. Uh, you start with the goal and then it's like military planning. Like what's the objective? And then you back up from that and you get all the steps you need to take to get to the objective. And so with freelancing, you get, you get your, you get your, um, your, uh, what you need in a, in a given month, let's say it's, I don't know, 5k, just throwing out a number. Um, then you can back up and think about like, okay, I need to do a, you know, a long form piece. I need to do three long form pieces worth, worth a thousand bucks in this month. And then I got to do maybe a couple short ones. Um, and, and you can kind of assemble the plan that way. Um, but it's, um, it's a lot of pitching. Uh, I, and again, I have not been a freelancer, so, uh, I'm, I'm not the best person to, to answer the question, unfortunately, but it's a lot of pitching and it's a lot of rejection and, um, it's, uh, it's, um, is, uh, I would definitely recommend working like all factoring all these issues in of expenses and whatever you need to get the story. It goes into your pitch. Um, I wouldn't do a story. I, I wouldn't like if I were a freelancer, um, I wouldn't do an assignment to like start on it unless I knew I had an editor at least mildly interested. Um, that way you're not, you know, you're not like going out, traveling, finding all these people. Uh, I, you know, it's a lot of things can be done over the phone. I do it every day. I'm out here in, in Southern California and, you know, I'm calling DC all the time, like the Pentagon and everything else. And so like, you, you don't need to incur uh, all these expenses. Like, you know, I know we want to do like the shoe leather approach all the time and that's great, but um, uh, really like a lot of journalism is just like trying to find the right person to talk to and then get them to talk to you. And if that's just, if that's in person, that's great. But most of the time you can do that over the phone. And so I would say like when you're honing your pitch or trying to come up with ideas, you maybe do some initial reporting steps, make a few phone calls, uh, see if the, the idea is viable and then work that into your pitch. So you're like, hey, I'm, I, I'm, here's my idea. Here's what I want to do. I haven't done it all yet, but I did, you know, I, I called this person. They seem interested. I looked at this research report uh, and this seems this is going to be good, some good background. And, and then here are the other, you know, three, four things I'm going to be doing if you say you like this idea. Um, and then, and then go from there. That way you kind of save yourself the time and the money. Uh, and you're only going after things that are actually like you're going to get paid on. Uh, cause it, it's a really, it's a big problem in the freelance world of, of getting paid. Uh, I'm, I'm really lucky, uh, to, to be at a company that pays freelancers very, very quickly. Uh, like we, I submit an invoice and then they pay them like two days later. It's amazing, but not, 
not everybody is like that. You know, a lot of times it's like a 30 day, maybe even 60 day, which is insane. Don't recommend working with those folks, but um, you know, it's, it's really hard. So you, it's like, you have to do, you have to do a lot of pitching and a lot of work um, to, to get there. And, you know, I hope that helps. <laughs> I, I uh, I'm happy if you got any other, like, if, if that, uh, if, if you want more, I'm, I'm happy to keep, keep going there. Yeah, no, Paul, that does help a lot. And my experience, you know, working with casting purpose was phenomenal. Like you were um, instrumental in, you know, the whole process. And, you know, the key takeaway from, for, for me is basically secure, you know, when you're working with, you know, uh, your publications is to secure the interest first prior to doing too much of the traveling and, and so on. Um, yeah. That definitely. Yeah. Just, just, if you, no, I, I, would say, I just say like, think of freelancing, like think of your freelance pitch. Um, think of it as a job interview. Think of that as a cover letter. Um, I don't need to see your resume, but I'm going to read a cover letter. I'm going to read your pitch memo. Um, and so you're selling yourself and then you're selling your story. And if it's compelling enough, you're going to get, you're going to get interest. Um, and, you know, over time you get better at pitching. Like I would, I would recommend like, I mean, tracking this stuff, tracking your pitches, like the language you use in your pitches. Uh, if you want a good pitch, talk to Drew. He had a really good pitch on the Afghan story. He, he had a, he had a, uh, he, he, he told it in a, in a storytelling well. And Jeff, you did a really good job on the EOD story. So I should reference you as well, but like the pitch, the narrative of the pitch uh, is, is really important. So if you, if you, you don't need to cross every I and dot every, uh, or cross every T and dot every I, but um, you, all you need to do is just generate excitement. And that's what a cover letter is. You're just trying to get the hiring manager excited. So they give you a call. That's it. It's just getting in the door. It's not getting the whole story out. It's not fully reporting it out or getting everything in place. It's just getting the call back. So if you focus with that in mind, just getting a response, then you're going to get a lot more hits. Um, and, and hopefully that, that leads to some success down the road. And, and Jeff, I, I'm glad you asked that question too, because um, one thing that I, I just want to pitch from the MBJ side is I dropped the link in there, but there's, we, we do have a mentorship program and I, I'm not sure if you're, you're a part of it. I welcome anyone who's actually in the, uh, in the chat to, to take a look at that link. Um, but, you know, there, we have um, so many journalists like, like Paul um, or others who've, who've done plenty of freelancing, like my um, mentor, Erin, uh, she, she freelanced for a long time um, and gave me a lot of, um, you know, ideas um, and, and mentorship about being a freelancer too. Um, so like that mentorship program is, is really um, top notch, at least at least from my experience, and I can speak to uh, for the experience of others who've, who've done it through through MVJ. Um, Mateo, I know you had your hand raised. Did you want to? Did you have another question? Yeah, you can. Uh, you're you have permission to talk. You can unmute, Mateo. Uh, all right. There you go. There you go. So um, for Jeff, like when you if you have a story idea that you want to pitch as a freelancer. When, when, you, uh, when you're doing the concept for the piece, it, it's my suggestion, do a budget, do a, do a rough budget. And then when you pitch the piece, if they like it, then you can talk about budget up front. And you know, if, if you can think about all the costs it's gonna take to, for you to get the story done. And if you can kind of come to some budget agreement with the editors before they give you the go ahead, that might help you out a lot. But back, back, back to what we were talking about earlier about the state, where, where journalism is today. Uh, I, you guys, I don't know if you remember this, but back in the 80s, they used to have regulations where in any metro market, if you were in the business of journalism, radio, TV, uh, print, you could not own more than one newspaper, one radio station, or one TV station in any metro market. They deregulated that. They got rid of that law. And so now 
media ownership is, uh, you know, you can, you can own as much as you can buy. So what happened was where you used to have a, a, a wide, wide diversity of, of different owners of, of newspapers and radio stations and TV stations. Now you have just a handful of people that own it all. And so I think that's bad for journalism. Then comes along uh, within the last 10, 15 years, you, you, you've got the internet. And so internet self-publishing. So, you know, take for example, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan blows up and now he's, you know, he's got, you know, millions of views for every podcast. And, you know, he kicks, he kicks CNN's ass. He kicks, he kicks all the major networks, the traditional legacy media. So I think it's kind of a nice, interesting time to be involved in ju online journalism and self-publishing because basically anybody can, can do it. And if you got a good idea and if you've got, uh, you know, a, a good plan and a, and a, and a, and a, and a good uh, market that you're going after, I don't think it's tough to succeed. What do you guys think? Yeah, um, I, I think I think you're right there. I, I, I look at like, I came into the journalism world at this time. Um, this was, you know, 2012. It was, it was a time of blogging. Uh, it right. was it was very uh, really fast paced kind of stuff. Lots of people having takes. This is when Gawker was in its prime and they were they were doing their thing. You know, I, I grew up in the, in the world of, of business insider and like fast, you know, punchy kind of journalism. Um, and, uh, it was, there was, a, this was this time where people could just start a blog and eventually they could build this huge audience. For example, Ezra Klein, um, uh, Matt Iglesias, uh, they started out as, as bloggers, uh, their own websites, and eventually they, they rose to this level of audience where the mainstream folks were like, oh, we got to snatch these, these folks up um, and, and pay them a whole lot of money to, to show us how to do this stuff. And so like the media itself, uh, a lot of publications got better at just being bloggers, and a lot of these bloggers with their side websites, they just went away. Um, and I think the, that now with Substack and other kind of platforms like that with podcasts as well, it's very similar. Um, it's a new era of uh, people all around the world, if they've got something to say, if they can string a, a, a couple of sentences together and, and people wanna keep reading it, you have platforms out there that can really, you can really reach people um, and, and really like serve a niche. So I, I think like it starts with knowing what your audience is. Um, I, we actually, there's a, there was a question up, I've seen the Q and A and I wanna just, I'll just answer it right away. But it was like, what is the initial steps for uh, starting a publication? And I think the initial step for starting a publication is to come up with an avatar of who your reader is. Um, I have a I have a person in mind for every piece of content that goes out on Duffel Blog, and I have a person in mind for every every piece of content that goes out on Task and Purpose. Like I'm thinking of who is reading this, and who is going to take this information in, and it helps me to write it in the way that is going to serve them best. Um, and frame it, you know, this is the headlines, this is the photo. I mean, a lot of things, a lot of decisions come down to who am I trying to get to? Who am I trying to reach? And so getting that focus of what your publication is going to be about um, and then who it's going to actually serve, you have to answer those two questions. And if you don't have those two questions answered, then you don't really have a publication. Um, you know, it, it, you can have a good idea, but without the audience for it, it's not, it's not really the best idea. And so you should try something else. Like there is a way you can get a little bit too niche. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of niches out there that can be found. I mean, a great example on, on Substack uh, is a newsletter called Heated by uh, a journalist named Emily Atkin. And this is a crazy super niche kind of publication that I, 
I honestly, I didn't, I didn't really, I understand it now, but I didn't think like it was like, there was a huge audience for it, but it was like all about climate change reporting uh, for, it was the, the tagline is um, uh, climate change was something for people who give a damn. And it, it her, she, she basically took the tack of like holding companies accountable for, um, for, you know, climate inaction and governments and things like that. And she tapped, like, I'm not an expert, expert in that world. So obviously I'm an idiot. I didn't think that was an audience for it, but she knew that she did. Uh, and she identified a niche and she, she identified her audience, the people who give a damn about this stuff. And then she serves them every day uh, with, with stories for that. Uh, and, and people are paying for that. Um, the, the most popular, uh, the most popular sub stacker, I think the most popular, uh, is, uh, is called popular information. That's by, a, a, a guy named Judd Leg, Leg, Legum, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, it's all about accountability, uh, accountability journalism and, and political donations. And it's very like, really like in the weeds, uh, kind of, kind of stuff in, in politics. Again, really, really honed in niche. And, um, but it's one of those things where he fills a gap where the, the mainstream, the bigger publications don't do it. And so that's why people pay him. Um, because they know like, all right, New York Times is not really going to dig into the, the, uh, the records of donations, you know, from like AT&T to Republicans, but Judd will, and Judd's going to write a story that says like, Hey, AT&T is still donating to Republicans, even though AT&T said they wouldn't support, like they were against the, the January 6th attack. And so they're holding this company accountable uh, to their words. He's the one guy that's doing it. And so he's providing value to his, to his readers and, and serving that niche. And, and he's doing really well as a result. Uh, Karim has a good question about how does one get started on the DOD beat or different posts for stories that are a little bit more involved? And if Karim, you wanna raise your hand and hop in and, and elaborate on that, you feel free to, feel free to do that. There you go. Oh, sorry, that was Bethany. One sec. All right, there you go, Kareem. Oh, uh, yeah. I've been talking about um, how to pitch stories and how to, um, like, we'll kind of sample against each other. I was I'm speaking of pet folks right now, but I was, I've been discussing, like, what stories to kind of pitch, but, like, the stories get, like, a bit more involved, like, say, an investigation or just, like, a big policy issue. And if you don't have that kind of background, how does one get started? Like calling the DOD up and like getting background information or calling a post up and asking how do you get information about such and such incident? I'm I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing. Um, I I'm, I I don't know if I got the question all the way. Kareem, Kareem if I if I can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially, Paul, the question is how, how do you get started in, in DOD reporting, especially when it um, you know, involves like more in-depth or investigative pieces. Where do you, where do you begin? How, you know, who do you call? How do you start calling people out on, um, you know, stories that, that need to be told that are a little bit more involved? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think if you're, if you're a freelancer uh, and wanting to get involved in the DOD beat, um, now has been, it's probably not been, it probably hasn't been a better time. Um, and really that's because the military reporting and, and newsrooms in the military reporting world uh, and newsrooms across the country have really been decimated. Um, you know, uh, my competitors um, uh, are our competitors. I think they've, you know, they're, they're smaller than they once were, you know, military times, I think is, used to be like a huge organization. Now they have, uh, they had to lay off uh, quite a few journalists, uh, you know, like a year ago or so. And, um, you know, that that sucks. I hate to see that. Um, and I, I wish it were not, were not the case. Um, but there's one, there, there's one kind of thing that opens up 
that that one thing opens up an opportunity for freelancers in that there's a lot of stories that are not being covered by these outlets. And that includes, that includes TNP, you know, like I said, at the top, we, we have to really focus on the why and the focus of what's matters. And, and, you know, we don't do every single story. Um, and so, uh, there's, there's so much happening in a day. Um, there's DOD reports, there are GAO reports being put out. There's stuff from the Congressional Research Service put out. There is uh, every single day there are uh, units, military units, uh, all, all across the country and all across the world putting out public information, photos, videos. There's DIVIDS press releases going out uh, that no one ever sees. And there's all of these things are all over the place and they're opportunities for stories. Um, so, you know, we start like, we'll look at, we'll look at in our daily, uh, in our, you know, daily, like working at task and birds, we're looking at the, the DOD press releases and what they're, what they're doing. Sometimes that'll be a slight rewrite of the press release, but not really, not often. It's usually like a starting point uh, for, like we'll start there and then we'll do some reporting out and then we'll come up with some other concept that's not that um and so like if you're looking for ideas um for um you know trying to get the dod uh in the dod beat you have to immerse yourself in it um and i guess i'll like i just for me i um I was a I was a Marine infantryman, and like every other Marine infantryman, uh, I sat in the barracks and played a whole lot of F Xbox, and you know was bored and 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 tried to avoid work. <laughs> but but uh, also part of that is um, you know in the Marine Corps we're big on uh, one of the one of the like things they tell you a lot is like be technically and tactically proficient. It's one of the, it's like the main thing for a leader. You have to be technically and tactically proficient. And so in the infantry, that was like reading pubs. That was reading about the infantry, reading about uh, battles and understanding tactics and knowing my job as best as I possibly can and thinking uh, more and like not being like, not just, you know, waiting around to being told what to do, but trying to, uh, understand and be the best infantryman I can be. And I kind of take that same, I take that same tack. Like I've been reporting on the military for uh, almost a decade now. And I'm really like, at this point, it's my life. I'm like immersed in it. I read military books. I read military, you know, I, I watch like every military show and movie and everything else. And like, I'm reading constantly all around the military. And you know, I miss a bunch of other stuff like, like news wise, cause it's not relevant to me. I've just like, this is my focus. This is what I have to do. Um, and so developing your focus, what, what you want to look into and what you want to, what you're passionate about, um, whatever that is in the DOD, look for that, see if, see if anybody else is even looking at doing it. And if they're not, that's probably a good place to, to find freelance pitches. And Kareem, just to talk about MVJ to, to kind of help support that, um, you know, the network is, the MVJ network is, is important for, for getting the story ideas too, just to give you an example. Um, you know, the first tip, I guess, that I, that I got out of the army um, that led to a story for, for actually task and purpose was because, someone in MVJ said, hey, I'm looking for, you know, someone to tell a story and your name came up. Here's like kind of X, Y, and Z. And then I looked into it and turned it around and pitched to Paul and um, it, you know, it became a piece. Um, and that's just because, you know, I could, I went into MVJ and kind of put my name in there and said, hey, I want to be more involved in this. And, you know, just getting your, your name out there in the community, like people will, have you at the top of your mind when they're like, okay, who's, who do I know who wants a story and who do I think is going to be good to, to tell it? 
Um, and, that, and that's important for to to be an MV to as you know MVJ member. Um, I don't think if I were you know part of MVJ, I would have definitely wouldn't have gotten that story. And uh, Paul, I don't know if you remember, but it was you know about an Afghan interpreter who went and became a U.S. Army soldier and was like trying to get his family out of uh, Kabul. And you know his his story went on uh, to go like to other other publications, but you know task and purpose and really MVJ was the was the first organization that had heard of it. Um, so that would, that would just to you know go off what Paul said, that'd be my recommendation as well. Yeah, it, one thing you said the the um, you know like being top of mind. Um, you know if you're if, is for me, I'll speak for myself. Like if I have a freelancer I've worked with, like if we worked with, with each other one time, then I am more likely to work with you again, right? Like we have, we've developed a relationship, we have some rapport and I've seen your work on my page and it was good, you know? So like just getting your, your foot, foot in the door that first place and just having a little bit of record there um, it really does help. I have, and, and, you know, like another MVJ member, uh, is, uh, is Daniel Johnson. Um, and he's, he's written for us, uh, he's crushing times. it. He's doing a great job. He's, he's awesome. Yeah. And he's, he's written for us a few times and he was, he was like, he, he approached me totally cold email and said, here's this pitch idea. And I thought, Hey, this is kind of cool. Let me try this guy out. I don't really know him that very well, but he's got a good idea. Let's see how he does. And he did a really great job. And now, uh, now he's pitching me, he'll pitch me stuff that uh, ideas he has, but he's also on my mind. Like I kind of have a sense for the stuff that he likes to do. And so if I have an idea or anything along those lines, I'm like, Hey, Daniel, like, what do you think of this? Can you do that? And, um, you know, he actually did two pieces like that for us this month. So, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it, pitching is, is one thing. It's also like, um, you know, just trying to develop relationships with, with editors and, and networking, uh, is also, uh, is, is also going to be really helpful. And, and I think Twitter is especially a really, uh, good, good tool here to, you know, having direct communication with people. There's no barrier. You know, you can just tweet at somebody and, and, and begin a relationship. And like, I have, I have people that I have interacted with on Twitter uh, for, you know, years and years and years. And I don't even know their, who they are for real. Um, but we, we talk all the time, you know, like we're, we're chatting all the time. And like, I, now, even though I don't know them, I still like, I value this random like, anonymous person's opinion because they've, they've been talking to me for such a long time and they actually like care to follow me and really, you know, care what the hell I say, who the hell am I? So, um, you know, networking and, and pitching and, and relationships, it's, it all really goes together. Um, and, uh, you know, the more you can do that, the better. And, and Paul, I, You've been so generous with your time. Um, I want to ask one more question, and I'll um, I'll uh, I'll leave it open, like as we're as I'm asking this last question. But you know, we we've talked a lot about we've kind of like skirted around one of your issues in terms of balancing, uh, you know, the story and the editorial process and the editorial independence with the um, the, the business side of things, the entrepreneurial side of things. Um, and, and to me that, that boils down to, you know, readership clicks, how far someone gets down in a story. Um, and I know, you know, those are, well, I'm assuming um, those are kind of metrics that you may pay attention to as the, as the editor in chief. And I'm wondering, you know, do you, do you see those metrics and do you apply them um, to, the direction of task and purpose editorial wise, or do you keep them separate or is it kind of a hybrid? Um, I look at, yes. So the answer is yes. I use the metrics. I value them and I, I look at them. I mean, I have chart beat open every day. Um, so, you know, 
traffic is important to ask a purpose. You know, if we don't have readers, we don't have a website, we don't have publication, right? So I do have to care about uh, the, where that, where, where it's coming from and what page views are like and how many visitors I have and things like that. I view the metrics as a, like a guide. It's a helpful, it's a helpful tool. It's not the end all be all. The, the first thing is like the creativity, like, again, like going back to it, who's the audience for this? Why does it matter to them? Um, and I use the metrics. The metrics tell me that they answer that for me. Like sometimes we'll do, sometimes we'll do stories. Um, we'll do stuff. Uh, we'll do like some short piece, something really short. Uh, and maybe it'll take us like an hour or two to do. Uh, but that's like a test. It's like, you know, this is a concept. Maybe it's not a, maybe it's not a news thing, but like, we'll, we'll, we'll try this headline and see if it works. And we've only committed two hours to that versus working on a story all day and then seeing it completely bomb, you know? Um, so like, that's an example of, of, uh, like how I'd use it. Like we'll, we'll, we'll do a, we'll do a quick story, see if it works, uh, see if readers are interested and then, okay, maybe that will deserve a follow-up. Like, uh, you know, just the other day, uh, the Sergeant Major of, uh, first Marine Expeditionary Force was relieved, uh, relieved of his, his position. Um, I wasn't thinking all about the metrics or anything like that. I'm thinking like, uh, that's that's news judgment. I'm like, okay, big big deal. Sergeant Major, forty seven thousand Marine strong unit. That's a big deal. We should probably cover that. Uh, but it's it's going to be competitive. So let's do this as fast as possible. And I'm telling the the writer like, give me you know three hundred words. We just need to get this thing up real quick. Um, and he does that. And then I'm looking at, at Chartbeat and I'm thinking like, all right, do people actually care about this? And okay, it's getting read and it's, and I can look at the engagement time. Um, and I look at how long people are reading uh, and it, it varies on different websites, like what's a good engagement time. Uh, but like, you know, generally like if people are reading it over a minute on the web, that's, that's pretty good. You know, like web readers are very fickle and, you know, we, we all do this. We're all on our phone. We click in. We're like, eh, get out of here. You know, and a lot of people do that. Um, so if you're looking at Chartbeat and you see like lots of views, lots of engagement, okay, you know, you, know, you got a hit. And now I can, I can take that and factor that into my decision making of does this merit a follow up? And, you know, if all signs are pointing to positivity, then yes, okay, that'll be a follow up. And if not, then, then no. Now, but again, it's like, it's just a guideline. So even if, even if um, nobody read that story, um, I, I still sometimes will determine like, hey, this story is really important and it just needs to be on our website. Like, I don't care if uh, a zillion readers, like they don't come in and read this, that's okay. Cause I know as the editor, like I have to have this piece on my website, um, just like, I think it's important. I have to have it. Um, and you know, we just, we just throw it up there, you know, you know, like just to, just to get it done. But, um, yeah, that's like, that's the metrics thing. It's like a lot of, a lot of places are really, uh, super duper focused on it. Um, and, um, you know, you can get, you can get a little bit of trouble there with like just constantly chasing just page views. Uh, and we do, we chase page views. We want more views. We want as many people reading our stories as possible. I will not, uh, I won't hide from that. Like I want as many people as possible to read uh, the Task and Purpose website every single day. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm putting up junk to get people in the door. I'm not putting up listicles with like, you know, five, you know, cool tanks or whatever, uh, you know, five cool tanks we saw in Ukraine. Like, yes, I could probably get a ton of traffic like that. You know, if I wrote like the, the listicle of kittens or something like that, but um, it wouldn't be serving my audience and it'd be a short term gain for a long term loss of audience trust. 
Mateo, you had a, another question? Yeah, um, you were talk, we were talking about earlier about newsrooms being decimated. When I, well, I was at Pendleton, I was a, a combat correspondent, PAO. So sometimes I had to work the media desk. So I got to know all the beat reporters in Southern California and, and some national guys too, and gals. Yeah. And uh, they all they all got uh, put out to pasture. So uh, one guy, he was a San Diego Union Tribune military beat reporter, Rick. I want to say Rickman, Rick Rickman, maybe. Anyhow, he he got uh, furloughed out. This is like when the uh, newsroom started to really start to shrink and budget started to shrink and, and media got diversified. And the online uh, world was eating up market share. Mm -hmm. and so he started his own little uh, it was called I think it was a military minute and he did a daily one minute little news blip and it got picked up by different radio stations in Southern California That's good and then something happened and he he disappeared he, he got disenfranchised or he got sick of journalism I don't know what but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about access so being a former public affairs guy um, I I saw the old school style compared to like, I got out in 2005. So in the, in the early 90s, I worked for a guy named Colonel Fred Peck. He was the uh, chief spokesman during the Somalia thing when 1MF went to Somalia. And uh, when I worked for the Scout newspaper on Pendleton, we used to be able to cover bank robberies, rapes, DUIs, crashes. I mean, real news. I mean, he really believed in the First Amendment and he was able to uh, establish trust with the generals. And he said, look, you know, we have, we have to report this stuff because uh, people need to know what's going on with the Marines. I mean, the taxpayers fund everything and they have a right to know even the bad stuff, you know. Right. So when it comes to access now, like if you are, if you're always writing like very, very uh, tough stories about military, like Sergeant Major gets fired or uh, yeah. this general's having an affair and, you know, you're always doing that kind of <coughs> reporting, the, uh, the access is going to be difficult for you because they're going to know that every time that phone rings and it's that guy or that girl that's always reporting tough on us, we're not going to give them good access because we know that they're always going to write tough stories. So for the people that want to get into the business of writing about the military, uh, as a journalist, as a freelancer, you have to really know what you're doing as far as what type of content you're doing. So you do a softball story, you do a hard, hardball story. And I think uh, I had one buddy who used to work um, at the Pentagon in, in, in the public affairs. And he said there was like a four to one ratio that was kind of an unspoken written rule. So you could, you would write four positive stories and then they would kind of give you access for one negative story. So I don't know, I don't uh, know if it's true or not or anything like that, but it's just the point is that access is, is very, very important if you're gonna be a successful reporter on the military. And in order to get good access, you can't be that guy that's always, always, always writing tough stories on the DOD because they're not gonna, they're not gonna like it, and they're not gonna open the doors for you. Yeah, I, it, this is a, it's a good point, Mateo. I, I do, I, I disagree with you a bit though on the access front. I, I think access is important. Like, yeah, you want to have access to, to the, the, the you know, the big, the key leaders and things like that. But one thing that the DOD, uh, that, that we benefit from if we're in the DOD reporting world is, is the DOD principles, uh, uh, principles of information, which were signed in, in 2001 by Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. They're still in effect. And you can look them up on the internet, but it, it basically states that uh, media access will be not, not restricted, for even if for embarrassing things, um, and it it basically puts it puts it down as like the DoD cannot not answer your questions. Now, of course, there's all kinds of ways. You know, you're you're a PAO, so you know the the trickery of like not responding or trying to respond in a way that like doesn't answer the question. And I I deal with those all the time. Yeah, you can see it, you can see it at the daily Pentagon briefings. I mean, <laughs> right. sometimes it's just like we're not going to answer that. We don't have to. Yeah. We don't want to. 
it's, yeah. it's not something we want to get into right now. I'm not, I'm not going to go there, you know? Yeah. So what, you know, I, I get your point, you know, I, I know, I know the philosophy. I know that, you know, we, we cannot prevent uh, negative stories, negative reporting, because, you know, yeah. we owe it to the taxpayers to, to be transparent and honest, but the reality is different because I, I, I was one of the guys that had to go and say, yeah, you know, do we give this guy access for an interview with Colonel so-and-so or Sergeant Major so-and-so or, and sometimes it was just like, no, we don't want to do it because we don't like that guy. We yeah. don't like this. We don't like the way he reports on us. So we're not going to, we're not going to approve his request this time. I, or I, we're going to give him some, we're going to give him some BS reply. See, for, for us, for, for TMP, um, we, we will rarely do a story that requires access. Yeah. Um, so access is like, it's the, it's, it's the other step. Like, I don't think about how I'm going to approach the PAO first. Yeah. They're the last step. Uh, it's, 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 I, there's a lot of open source information out there now. True, true, true. So much to be found on the internet. If you're a really good researcher uh, and and know you know the, the tricks of Google, you can find a ton of information and um, get around these people, these gatekeepers. Um, That's or, true, but I mean, or make like, it so I'm, I'm kind of old school, so I go back to think about all the military beat reporters at the LA Times and the Tribune and some of the other publications. And these people were amazing. I mean, they, they knew everybody. They had contacts. They had, you know, wives, you know, dependent wives. They had veterans. They knew, they knew everybody in the community. And the, the depth of their reporting was just something you don't see these days because it's changed. They have lost, like, uh, you know, the corporate knowledge of, of these really, really good military reporters has kind of gone, gone yeah. by the wayside. And, you know, because they were so good and they had, they had big salaries. So, you know, they all got furloughed out. And now you've got a lot of, I wouldn't say rookie reporters, but re reporters that don't have the ability to go in deep like these old school reporters did. And to me, it's kind of sad, but that's just the way it is these days. Yeah. I mean, there's still a lot of really great military reporters out there and, and, you know, you, you'll find their names. Um, you know, there's, there's military.com, military times, of course, TNP. We have, we have really great journalists on, on staff and they, they know, they know the job pretty, really well. I think the, the biggest, the biggest thing that's changed um, is the timeline has, has shortened up considerably. So, you know, the, 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 the guy or gal at the LA Times that got an assignment and then has a week to do it, that's not something we can really do anymore. I know, I know. You don't, um, you don't see that anymore. We, 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 we used to see like four part series, you know, over a six month, you know, window. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people would travel to the other side of the world just to get one interview, you know, to a guy that was deployed in the field because he was key to the story. But that is almost impossible to do these days because of the budget. Right. I, I want to jump in with um, with Bethany's point uh, that she had mentioned in the in the chat. Um, you know, saying that it's great to discuss, but she encountered a similar problem at Camp Lejeune, refusing to give information as a local reporter, uh, even trying to do good stories. Um, they seem to only talk to Task Purpose, CNN, or, or bigger outlets. Um, and I, Bethany, I appreciate you you bringing that up because. Um, it's, it's a great point for, for local, um, you know, outlets that, you know, Paul's talking about that have, have been decimated, but are, are extremely key to the infrastructure of, um, of, you know, that community. Right. And like, I can't tell you how many, and, and Paul, you know, this just as well as anyone, but like how many, you know, Washington Post or Task and Purpose articles originated from, you know, a local story or a local outlet or, you know, a, a, a small publication outside of uh, Fort Bragg or something like that, that turned into, into something bigger. And, you know, Bethany, if you want to, um, you know, chime in and, um, you know, talk, talk about any part of that as a local reporter, that's, that's extremely important. And same with you, Paul, if you have anything. Yeah, sure. It was, um, I, I did uh, a small internship before I transferred to a different school out in California um, in Wilmington, North Carolina. So with the local NPR station, WHQR. 
And, you know, I came in the door, I emailed the PA, you know, I'm a Marine Corps officer major. I emailed them and let them know like, Hey, I'm a Marine reservist. I'm here. I'm working in news. I'd love to tell Marine stories. Like, um, and I would constantly get shut down and, um, I would, you know, they'd send me like what they want me to write, like the PAO would send me what they want to write, their photography, what they wanted me to use. And it basically was like, well, if you, you want to write a story, write it off what B said. And I'm like, well, that's just not good journalism. Um, and, you know, I basically just get stonewalled. And then the next thing I knew it was in Task and Purpose or CNN and, or, or you know, Washington Post, I think is a big one. And of course, you know, New York Times, but if it wasn't us, and, and I've heard other uh, mentors of mine say the same thing, like when they were with smaller outlets, they really struggle. Um, nobody wants to talk to you, so. Yeah, I I mean, yeah, thanks for bringing up, Bethany. I, um, I think, I, you know, it's, I, it's hard for me to answer this question, to be honest. Um, I, um, I think, I think public affairs is, you know, they should be <laughs> answering their phones and, and should be answering your questions. I think, and I don't know if you've done this, uh, like I'm sure you have, but like, uh, you know, just going back to like, if they're, I, I don't know if they've said, no, we are not going to answer you. Um, if they did that, that's, that's interesting. But like, I'm a pain in the ass to people. Um, I'm a huge pain in the ass. And so like, I call a PAO, ask question, ask the question I want to know right away. And then the typical response is like, send me an email on this. And so I sent an email right away. Um, and then I set a reminder, uh, and Gmail actually makes this a heck of a lot easier now because it's like snooze. Yeah. But like, I'll set a reminder on queries I send out uh, to come back in my inbox, and then I'll be a pain in the ass again the next day. Hey, what's going on here? Um, uh, call calling them regularly, like just because I know it looks like we get everything, like TNP, like we're just. It, they just love us and we get, they give it up, but that is not the case. We still deal with this stuff uh, just like everybody else. And the trick, at least for us is uh, I saw it in the, I see in the chat, Freedom of Information Act requests are a huge, huge resource. And I could put on a whole class here. Uh, maybe, maybe that's down the line for me. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> um, but FOIA requests are, are huge. You cannot stop them. Uh, they, they, I mean, you can, but you know, they're, they're usually pretty good. Um, but aside from that, it's really just being a pain in the butt and, and constantly, uh, calling them and emailing them, um, and letting them know you are not going to stop. A lot of PAOs are banking on reporters are too busy and they're just going to get, they're going to get busy and they're going to forget, um, I, I don't, I use technology to keep, keep that top of mind and like get, get, get back at it. So like, like one, like, you know, example of this is like the Scheller, uh, Stu Scheller, uh, he had, he was charged with all these things, uh, all these different crimes um, after those videos and stuff. And I requested the charge sheet. Um, which is a standard thing that you should be able to get without a FOIA request. Um, and I asked the Marine Corps for it. They were like, no, we're not going to give it to you. And I'm a pain in the ass. So I looked up the regulation. I quoted it back to them. I said, hey, this is what this says in the JAG manual. You're, you're freaking wrong. Give me the charge sheet. Um, and we had this long argument over the phone and email for probably a week or so. Uh, and then finally, uh, you, I called him out on it and how I called him out on it is by publishing. I published a story about the Marine Corps, not handing me over the charge sheet. And so like that, that is one way, um, that you can wrestle information out, um, is to put them on notice. Like, all right, fine. Like, you don't want me to write this story. Cool. I'll write a different one. Um, and it's it's really up to it's really up to you. Um, I just wanted to do a good story. I wanted to do a nice story about the Marine Corps, but 
since you're not doing it, I mean, I guess I can find something else. Like, <laughs> you know, like they, at least in my experience, they usually, they usually, you know, get the message. And, um, but, you know, the, the stonewalling thing is, it's, it's, it's across the board. It's just like, you have to, you have to really, you have to stand up for yourself and, and know that um, you're right you're a reporter, you're an American citizen, you have first amendment right uh, to access this, this information. And you're just asking questions on behalf of other Americans. And so if they're not answering you, it's not, it's not to me when the Marine Corps doesn't answer me, it's not them being like, you know, jerks to me. It's them being jerks to the American people. They're not, they're not answering questions that in the end come from those people like I don't just I don't come up with random ideas I usually get tips and people are telling me like hey ask about this and that kind of thing and so um it's I I take I take offense to that and I uh I I go after them pretty hard if they do it and like I know Mateo is, <laughs> Mateo is like like try to you know try to try to make four stories good or whatever and I I think that's something you can do but i i um i think it is i have, I have some really good insight here Paul. Well, one thing i one one thing i just said yeah 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 i think it's i think it's you can do as many negative stories as as you want there isn't i don't think there's really some magical quotient um it's just you have to be fair in those stories you know in the in the sergeant major relief story we didn't like say hey the sergeant major is a piece of shit like that that would get us in trouble. Um, let me tell you. Let me tell you how it really works. Line of of this happened. This guy got relieved. Here's you know there's an investigation possibly, and that's kind of it. It's just straight news reporting. Uh, here's ex here's exactly how it works. Okay. A story appears in the media. The general reads it because he gets the daily uh, the clips in the morning. So mm -hmm. everything Marine Corps he he sees what's published you know in short version. It's called the morning clips. We used to have to do the copies and take them to all the different uh, J shops. So the generals read it and, and the general's so busy, he either in his mind says it's a positive story or a negative story. And if he, if it's a negative story and if it's a big one, guess who get, has to go see the general? Hulk the, PA, officer. the PAO. <laughs> the PAO's in big trouble. The general's like, what, why is this happening? Why are we having negative press? And the PAO is well, sir. You know, we you know we had to answer the FOIA and blah blah blah. You know, know. and so the the, the PAO is in the hot seat, and his fitness report is going to reflect too much negative press. Fair, not fair. Mm. But the general don't think like that. The general's like, I'm the general. You're my PAO. Give me more positive press. That's the that's the reality of it. Right. So you got to understand you, the politics of fitness reports and promotions and all this stuff is happening behind the scenes. And here you have the reporter knocking on the door saying, hello, I'd like to do a story. And everybody's scared because the PAO has been pissed and he's been yelling at the lieutenants and the sergeants saying, you know, why are we having so many negative stories? Let's go out there and let's get some positive press. Come on team. Let's go. Let's go. So it works like that. And to go even back further, like a small little history lesson, uh, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld were both key figures in the Vietnam War. I'm in Vietnam right now. They came back on the scene with George Bush. And when they came in, they came in with this whole plan to change the way um, information works, like especially with the military. Because in the Vietnam War, the reason they couldn't continue the war was because there was so much reporting, like real time, real journalism, you know, gory pictures broadcast on the 6 p.m. news and everything and it just really got the country against the war and, and the, the pressure got so bad that they had to they had to give up and they didn't want to give up they wanted to continue the gravy train because you know they're making money military industrial complex so when these guys came back on the scene with George Bush they said we've got to change the way the media works because we can't be having this free open access the way it happened in Vietnam because then we can't do our wars so they changed the law. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but it used to be illegal to, to, to plant stories or try to influence uh, media 
to shape public opinion. There was a law against that. It's like a propaganda law. That law got wiped off the books uh, 20 years ago, I want to say. So now you have certain agencies, government agencies from America that are intimately working to influence me large media organizations. And even they have some people that are inside the organization. And so now, uh, and they have, it's, 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 all, it's all in the regulations. I mean, it's called information operations where they want to shape public opinion to form, you know, for recruiting purposes, you know, they want to make the military look good. They want to make, uh, you know, the public support the military and they don't want, they don't want bad news because they're trying to shape public opinion. And, yeah. uh, and that was a change because I came in in, in the late eighties. So I saw the transition, especially when the Cheney Rumsfeld and Bush team came in, I really could, you could feel it in the air, the way public affairs was like different, you know? Yeah. Anyhow, that's just my, my you, recollections. You hit on something though, that, that is, uh, I think relevant, uh, very relevant to the, the question from, from Bethany earlier about being stonewalled. Um, it's, it's the, the fit reps to the PAOs and the PAOs got to go up and they got to explain to the general, basically, you know, get, getting their ass chewed about negative coverage. Um, if you know that, then uh, of which I, I am well aware of, uh, having spoken to so many PAOs over the years, um, I am a pain in the ass, but I'm also a sweetheart to public affairs officers. I, I, uh, I understand and, uh, and express it to them that I know their job is very hard. I mean, I call the, the Sergeant Major story uh, as an example, like just as just to show this show this part to them, I'm like I call up the PAO at one MEF, and I say, "Hey, I'm Paul Zolzer from Task and Purpose. Uh, how's it going?" And like, I bet you're getting a lot of calls on this, but I gotta I gotta ask a few questions. Like I'm already like telling them like, "Hey, I know your I know your job is tough right now. You got a lot of calls, and I'm just the latest a hole to call you and ruin your day." Um, and I just try to talk to them like without any, um, without any, like, I'm not mad, you know, I'm not upset, emotional or anything. I'm just like, Hey, I just heard this thing happen. What's, uh, what's going on? Uh, what's the deal? And then it's like, and I kind of already know, like getting back to being immersed in, in the world, I know the public affairs regulations. So I know what they can answer. I know what questions they're not allowed to answer. So when I ask it, I'm like, all right, I know you can't, I know you're not gonna say it, but I gotta ask you, is this guy under investigation? Okay, like, give me the no, thank you. All right, moving on. Like, it's sort of, it's, it's like a, it's like a, it's a game over the phone with the public affairs officer where we know what the rules are. And I, he knows, he or she knows that I have to ask, all these questions and make him uncomfortable. And I try not, I try to make him, or him or her, sorry, but I try to make them, um, you know, not, not uncomfortable because I know they got to take that up and <laughs> they got, they got to deal with, with me uh, being the pain in the ass. And so I try to be uh, especially nice to them. And, and, you know, same thing goes for, for FOIA analysts, people who, who do the FOIA requests, it's the same thing. You know, you, you put in a FOIA and uh, it takes a really long time. Don't get mad at the FOIA analysts. They are incredibly under-resourced and understaffed and they are doing the best they can. Uh, and Congress won't give them enough money. So I call up the Marine Corps FOIA office. I'm like, hey, what's going on with this thing? Where is it in the queue? And like, I wish you guys got more money. You know, like it's it's trying to be uh, you're you're being a professional, but you're also being understanding and and friendly to them and understanding mm -hmm. what, what their role is uh, in this in this uh, little crazy reporting world. Yeah, yeah, that was a great answer, Paul. I appreciate you uh, doing that, and I want to have uh, Mateo back to do a 
history lesson on PAO. <laughs> right. <laughs> Bethany to uh, do um, help us out with like local reporting, and then we'll get you back for uh, for a FOIA class, like, and we'll do it in three hours, and it'll be great. Because uh, we can really, we really could talk forever uh, about this. But Paul, I know your your time is uh, short, and I appreciate you um, going over over time um, to talk to us tonight. But you know, as a as a um, you know reporter and editor, you know that the best answer comes always at the end of the phone call in the webinar. Um, is there anything that that we didn't cover tonight that you you want us to know? Is there anything in the future for Duffel Blog or Task and Purpose that you want to plug here? Um, what do you got for us? Ah, uh, yeah, you're you're so right. You gotta you gotta you have all the softballs. And you have softball, 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 and like then you're walking out the door. And it's like, oh, oh, by the way, forgot to ask. Forgot to ask yeah. this one question. And yeah. it's, it's the one that they don't want to answer. Uh, exactly. so, um, this was this was not that, but I appreciate that. But uh, I think um, plugging wise, I mean, I think just if you're uh, if you're a fan of task and purpose, you're definitely going to see some more video uh, uh, coming soon. You know, like I said, we got that that military basics thing coming up and we're going to ramp up a lot there. Uh, and the video is really video uh, is is really designed to support our journalism and and to open up new new avenues there. We're we're also expanding the the contributor network and continuing to build that. So if you're on this call and you uh, you know you're you're inspired, you have some ideas, uh, please pitch me. Um, and and if, uh, Drew, if you could send those guidelines along to people, that'd be great. Yeah, of course. Um, if you don't know, like if you just if you're just searching for like how to pitch task and purpose, Google how to pitch task and purpose, and you'll you'll find that that link. Um, but other than that, um, you know, please please follow our our work at Task and Purpose, and and if you like Duffel Blog, you know, check check out Duffel Blog, and um, if, you, if anybody here you know needs anything, just shoot me an email. I'm at Paul at taskandpurpose.com and uh like i said my my inbox can be a disaster zone so it 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 may take me a, a, a bit to respond but um you know i i definitely answer answer emails so uh i won't i won't ignore you i'm happy to happy to answer answer questions uh anything you might have missed or didn't get to uh today and and uh yeah and and maybe just follow me on twitter that would be great yeah, Paul, thank you so much. Um, like, as I mentioned, this is the first of three um, workshops that we're doing on entrepreneurial journalism. Uh, check us out next week. We have some great guests. Uh, but Paul, thank you so much. Um, and we'll be in touch. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thanks so much for, for attending. I really, really appreciate it.